Welcome to the Poke It podcast with me, Nicola Cairncross, and my co-host, Pete Jenkins. In the show, we'll be getting deeply interested in everything and everyone, including business and entrepreneurship, investing, crypto, great films, books, and sci-fi, served up with great food and wine, and a little bit of gamification and the odd guest thrown in for good measure. You can join in the conversation anytime at the Poke It podcast private group on Facebook. Now let's see what we're going to be poking at today, shall we? Okay, I think we're ready to go. That's cool. We're recording. And you just missed my funniest bit. Oh. <laughs> That's as funny as I get, mate. <laughs> just the fringe comment. Well, yes, yeah, a comment that my the quality of my contribution to this podcast is not determined on how groomed my blow dry is, but I did do the fringe to make me brainier. The quality of mine is determined by how much caffeine I've had, and unfortunately, I'm still on my first cup. <laughs> what we got to shouldn't should shouldn't but will share with the listeners is that uh, we have decided that on our strategy meeting, also known as a poker night, that um, we have to work out today what we're going to be talking about going forward. And I realised in the shower that we've actually got very different audiences. That's very true. So that's going to be interesting, isn't it? Because your audiences, uh, well, I'll let you tell us about them in a minute, but my audiences are largely small business owners, SME, MDs, marketing directors, et cetera. And I largely talk about money and marketing. And who are your audience, Pete? My audience are people who are interested in psychology and engagement ah. and motivating people. So it could be a, a, quite a mix, actually, from learning, people involved in learning to uh, – bosses actually quite a lot of small businesses there's quite a few people who gamify their apps oh like no well, i have an app as you know do i do i know that <laughs> what's your app well, i have got an app if you go to nicolacarecross.com forward slash app or the itunes store or the google store you'll find the clicks and leads app okay. and it feeds through useful articles and information and videos and audio about marketing and money and much, much more. That well, sounds like a really great way to get content in front of people, actually. Yes, yes. And oh, I okay, think it's yeah. ra rapidly becoming more important because people are very fractured. And, and, you know, I teach the whole be everywhere online thing. That's because everyone's on different platforms. Some people never move to Twitter. Some people are always on Instagram, some, you know, but the app brings everything together that you're creating into one place that your customer or potential customer can have on their phone on their, what's that called that thing on the front of your phone screen. Yeah. That's the one, you know, the home screen, <laughs> home screen, the home screen. That's interesting. Yeah. So what you're saying is give your customer an extra. A yeah, whole extra it, it, uh, platform. Yeah, and it feels like a a real value add because um, they don't have to go hunting for your content, but it means that you get your content in front of them. Um, the only thing I've yet to work out how to do is to get my app to. Um, I can send messages, which is quite useful. Um, are, are they text messages or emails? I'm not sure. But or notifications. Uh, yeah, no. Oh, there could be notifications. Yes. So I could notify people every time I put a new bit of pillar content, as it's called, up, but it doesn't have the little number showing how many bits of pillar content they've missed. Constant sort of an, source of annoyance, that is. Uh, yeah, okay. So because you need a little count. That makes yes, sense. that would be good. Yes, and apparently that j jogs people because they can't bear having numbers that, you know, the, the among us need to get rid of that those, those numbers of things we've missed. I have been known to use this in some of our projects. <laughs> but we've deep dived straight into a topic, haven't we, which we shouldn't do, really. Shouldn't we? I feel like that's what we're going to end up doing quite a lot. Yeah, probably. This is a, a conversation about what, what interests us and what we want to poke at. So that's where we'll go, shall we? My, my customers are very much interested in motivation and gamification although they probably wouldn't call it that because they have to motivate themselves to get out of bed every morning and make their business work yeah i mean um we quite in our industry that comes under like a subcategory of self gamification yeah um, oh okay so or productivity you know so there's um there's some interesting things there there's quite a lot of gamification around health and fitness which is aimed at that sort of customer as well you know oh that's nice i was wondering how i was going to adjust myself to be as tall as you 
Well, no, I've just reduced myself to be as small as you. <laughs> We're still far finding our way with all the new technology and everything, aren't we? Well, also, I moved my desk and my camera overnight, and everything's we just, in a different position. Oh. Just, <laughs> well, I woke up with a horrible start at 8 o'clock this morning, because I have a call at 8 o'clock for my New Zealand and Australian clients, and I actually set the alarm for 715 and um, I obviously just closed my eyes and went back to sleep again, which is not a great thing. But something something beeped at me and made me realise I should be at my desk at eight o'clock. So I managed to get there within a minute. So that's pretty good going. Very impressive. Yes. Oh, that takes me right back to like 20 years ago when I was working as a financial advisor. And my phone rang while I was fast asleep and there was someone next to me as well but apparently i just sat up answered the phone and had a normal conversation about something business related <laughs> and then put it down and went back to sleep <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think a lot of people are finding that um these skills are coming in useful now that everyone's working from home yeah you know what we need is pillows that look like desks or something or chairs or chair yeah. bags that's yeah. it isn't it so you could be lying in bed and it just looks like the back of a chair or something that'd be quite yeah nice. You need to move your mic just a little bit away from your mouth. It's a little bit, that's it, a little bit blowy, as it were. Mm, maybe I've got <laughs> strong nostrils. Yeah, it's still happening. So can you move it a bit more? I'll, I'll edit this bit out. That. Yeah, yeah, that's much better, yeah. That's going to tickle my um, Up a bit. How's that? Try now. How's that? Yeah, it's good. It's nice and clear, and hopefully we won't get the breathing sounds. Okay, good. So, um, so one of the things we want to talk about today is what this podcast is going. We're going to talk about what the structure it's going to look like, if any. And ha have you any thoughts about that? Uh, well, I mean, like, obviously, the theme of poke it is around poking things to see how they work. But I was thinking that our shared interests are quite often around social media platforms and mm -hmm. marketing and motivation, mm -hmm. and these all interrelate. Um, and money and money i'm really interested in money <laughs> i'm really interested in companies so yeah. um i don't when i say money i don't actually mean hoarding it i mean making it and growing it i'm thinking of investing it so like understanding yes. certain companies and what they're doing having a poke at them would also interest yeah. me yeah because i learned some of what to look for in a company that you're interested in investing in a long time ago when i was pregnant with nelson actually so that's 22 years ago um, I read a couple of books, Bernice Cohen's Armchair Investor and Jim Slater's Zulu Principle, which were really solid books. But that was all about understanding the fundamentals of a company and their profit earnings ratio and things like that. And then looking at the, what the price action is doing on the technical front. But I think that fundamental analysis has gone right out the window recently. Just the stock market isn't it. behaving as it should. Yeah, exactly. You know, the, the, is it the um, S and P five hundred? It's being entirely propped up by five companies, the big five tech companies. So, you know, it's it's all it's all gone haywire, Pete. And today, it might go even more haywire because of the Fed meeting to talk about how they're going to stimulate the economy and make inflation rise. They deliberately make inflation rise, which actually yeah, it's probably a good yeah. idea <clears throat> if you look at Japan historically. Yes. Yeah. Well, exactly. Yes. And um, what they're going to try and do in order to get it to an average of two to five percent, they're probably going to aim for something like 10 to 15 percent initially. Because obviously an average is it goes up and down, doesn't it? So you've got to get a middle ground somewhere. So we're all all of us in the investment community are waiting eagerly for that. That, tells, what, me, that what, tells me if they succeed, you don't want to be in property with the high interest rates that will be along with it, along with. Inflation. Yeah. Yeah, there is there is a big property boom at the moment due to the stamp duty holiday, but that is not going to last. And a lot of very successful property investors I know are selling the properties that are not quite so strong on yield, you know, rental yeah. yield, and selling the properties where they have a problem tenant <laughs> and selling the properties that need perhaps in the next five to ten years will need a lot of work doing to them. They're keeping those just sound, the those really all sound like ones you should get rid of anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But when you're when you're a, a rental owner, you know, you sometimes you've got a tenant who's a problem, or you've got a property that you know the roof's going to need doing in the next five years, 
or you've got a property that doesn't yield as much rent as you put into it initially, the capital sum, on a percentage basis. So that's what the criteria are for what's what's being sold at the moment. Of course, it's, they're selling like hotcakes because nobody's having to pay stamp duty or much less stamp yeah, duty. Yeah, saving big chunks. Yeah, just gone the opposite dad's... way. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> sold mine. So you just sold. Yeah. Chunk of cash that I'm trying to make sure grows faster than it would have done in property. Okay. Yeah. And um and I think you've got out just at the right time, Pete. I really do. I think the property market in the next ooh, three to six months will start heading downwards because of lots of people losing their jobs primarily. Yeah. And then, I mean, I'd always plan to go out because I feel like there's a recession due because of Brexit as well. Mm. Mm. So that's like end of December. And that'll take like three to six months to kick in. But that'll also be due to lack of, more lack of jobs. So Yes. Yeah, we don't want to start this podcast on a downward note, but I'm I'm afraid today's a big day with the Fed announcements. Do you know the other thing that that well, the um, upward I note? Picked... The upward note is is that hey, now's a good time to get out. What else are we going to do with the money? You know. Well, exactly. Wealth cycles, as we yeah. know. Have you watched the wealth cycles video yet? Yes, on, I um, did YouTube? watch that. Yes. Excellent, excellent. About the different you know markets going up and down at different times, and if you can chop them up. And to, instead of going down with the down market of that thing like yeah. property, you can actually chop it at that point and turn it onto an upwards thing for the next asset class. It's just a nice so, thing, isn't it? Which is the money always has to go somewhere. It does. Yeah. So it's about and there's lots more of it. Do you know what? Lots I think that's why there. the stock market doesn't behave sensibly. It's because everyone has to put their money somewhere and there's more money than the companies are worth. And they have to grow it. They have to put it where the growth is. Yeah. And at the moment, that's in these weird, what are they called? D DeFi. What's it called? Decentralized finance. Decentralized DeFi. finance, yeah. So now you're going into the blockchain side of things. We'll have a look yes. at that at some point. Yeah. <laughs> well, I need, I'm, I'm watching videos to try and understand what D DeFi is all about because as far as I can see, it just looks like – the wild, wild west days of the early cryptocurrency world where people were just inventing cryptos because they could and there was no innate value underneath them. So I think it's simpler than that, but it, but it is wild, wild west in terms of who to use and how it works. But it's, yeah. it's, it's basically like replacing the banks. Okay, so I've been an investor in Zopa, which is peer-to-peer -peer lending, so taking out the bank. Okay. So as an investor, I, a lender, I become a lender, I should make more return because I'm not just lending it to a bank and they're taking their cut. I'm lending direct to end end users, end borrowers. Companies? Borrowers. No, people, actually, with Zopa. Companies is other platforms like Funding Circle. Oh, okay. Okay, um, which I think is actually riskier. And the, the beauty of something like Zopa is you might – you might put a thousand pounds in, but it will be spread across a hundred people, so ten pounds to each. So it spreads your risk. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't know about that one. You'll have to send me the links for both of those. And this so one, there's another one called Rate Setter that does similar. And what kind of potential return can you get on these these things? So there are some choices within them, depending on the platform. So Zopa has like three levels of credit risk you can lend to. So if you go for the ultra safe you might get a 3% return. If you go for a bit mm. riskier or longer term, you can get up four and a half, five and a half, six and a half. But when I started on it, which I think was seven years ago, some of the returns were eight or nine, 10% because you could actually set it yourself for different credit risk scores, but they've simplified it a lot since then. And this is per annum? That's per annum, but of course, every time you get a repayment, you can auto reinvest it. Okay, so you so, can turn over your capital more than once in a year. Yeah. So uh, so you get repayments and you get interest, so you can reinvest those immediately just by ticking a box, which I quite like. Yeah, absolutely. So so what what if if I was going to ask you about your best year on any of these platforms in terms of return, what what would you would you say that you know that? No, I, I, actually, I would say I don't know that. <laughs> oh dear, only it's because a difficult like, question. <laughs> it's not difficult, but it's it's a small part of what I do. I would know. At a glance, which was a good year for my business. Yeah. 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 Someone. Well, we, that's we, why we have annual. Annual accounts. Yeah. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? 
the only reason I've got investments in things like Zopa, because actually the best return on investment I've ever got was just putting money into my own business, mm. is to spread the risk, yeah, and to have some yeah. money working for me without effort. So I, I'm only really looking for mostly investments that don't take much mental time, much give me much mental load, you know, because yeah. I mean, years back, I used to do day trading on the stock market. Um, which was a lot of fun, but you had to be doing it full time. Yeah. You do have to be watching it all the time. I've learned that with trading Bitcoin because in a market when, especially at the moment where there's not so much liquidity in it because everyone's holding on to their Bitcoin in the anticipation of it going up. Um, the minute I set a stop loss, the price starts heading down to meet it. So that tells me there's not a lot of liquidity in in, in the exchange I'm using, which is one of the biggest ones. So I, I'm having to do everything manually rather than putting in, all, and, unless I'm going to walk away for a, a day or two, in which case I do set a stop loss. But I set it much lower than I would like to because I found if I go too to low. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So can I, can I ask then, because I'm nosy like that, um, everybody thinks that putting money into a business is a great idea. Everybody doesn't know that how many businesses go out of business in the first five years or the first year and then the first five years. Um, I read a fantastic book called uh, Rich Dad's Guide to Investment where the, the last, th you know, the Rich Dad book, Poor Dad books. I do. I've not read them all, oh, yeah. but I'm aware oh, of Oh, well, no, but the, every, a lot of people have read the first one, which is fantastic. But the the, the hidden secret in, in those books is um, Rich Dad's Guide to Investment, because the last third of the book is all about how the best investment of all, as you just said, is investing in your own business. But it's also the riskiest. Oh, yeah. Because most people start a business and don't have a clue what they're doing. But, but if you're and, a control freak like me, it's also a nice place to put your money. Yeah, yeah. And then... The thing is, though, you are subject to variables, aren't you? I mean, how long have you been in business? Oh, I can answer this one. My company was 20 <laughs> years old last Sunday. There you go. Right. So you've lived through at least two out of the ordinary events, like the credit crunch and global recession in 2010, um, and then this pandemic followed by what we think is going to be a depression, not just a recession. Yeah. Was there anything else in that 20-year span that came out of nowhere? There was... There was a, a currency issue back in the early days of the business. And we did a lot of importing of software. So you, mm -hmm. you always used to say, I mean, I teach entrepreneurship at the university. And one of the things I talk about is, um, uh, oh, I've forgotten the phrase for it, where, where you um, test your assumptions on your figures. So you might assume oh, okay, like your yeah. costs will go up by 20% because of something and that you might lose 20% of your customers for some reason. And then one Christmas, there was like a currency between EU and uh, the euro and GBP that basically made all my imports cost about 20% more. At the same time, I lost my biggest client, which was about 20% of my income. Ooh. So I had that exact thing. I was like, yeah, it can happen. <laughs> so had you allowed for it? That's the question. Well, good Lord, no, we were living right to the edge. But <laughs> <laughs> he's telling the truth here, people. <laughs> um, the hardest bit to replace was the client, actually. The the costs change. Well, you just have to move quickly and pass the costs on. And we were doing a mm. monthly software service, so we were only really out of pocket for about a month or two, depending on what contract we were in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, the hard bit was so cause it tough. was like New Year. It was Christmas Eve, so there was actually not a lot you could do about it except just go. Oh, that's Over a great Christmas. Christmas. New Year. <laughs> yeah. Oh God, that sounds terrifying. So you've lived through three big events that are um, anomalies, black swan events. They're yep. called. Aren't Yes. And and you've managed to survive all three. Yeah. Do you know what? And COVID has definitely been the worst from a financial point of view because we'd moved to complete, almost complete income being generated from work abroad, speaking at conferences, running workshops. Um, three mm -hmm. staff just dedicated to that part of the business and it died in a week. <laughs> Oh, no, that's it was so terrifyingly quick, yeah. wasn't it? Nobody really, I mean, people, we saw it coming, but we didn't really, really realise what the full implications of lockdown were going to be. I didn't, I didn't, certainly. I, I saw it really quickly because, you know, events were being cancelled and postponed left, right and centre. And also yeah. from a cash flow perspective, all our outstanding invoices were owed by events companies who suddenly had no income. So, yeah. 
Except one. I had yeah. one in this country, which was a big, outstanding invoice. And so we've got the law behind us. So I passed that straight to my credit controllers, who got all that money. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned that last week. They got all my money. <laughs> so have fine. You, <laughs> how did you? I know that I'm. I'm doing. I'm going into interview ah, mode. Stop this is something I've warned you about. It's about eating. <laughs> it's about <laughs> subjects. We're supposed to dive into different subjects. Okay. All right. Well, I, I know as an entrepreneur who's been through many, many, many ups and downs um, and who's always started companies on a bootstrap. I've never had, apart from one, a record label in the 80s where we had something like £25,000 of um, a loan from the government. You know, it's government back loan to start the record label. And um, apart from that one time, there, there has been no capital, excess capital in the business at all. And I'm very guilty of not taking money out in the good times to pay myself back the money I've put in in the, in the bad times. And I've learned that lesson over the years because I think it's really important for the business owners to take money out, you know, properly, legally, as, as they should, to, to pay themselves back. Um, because then you can always decide to lend it back to your business, can't yeah. you? But if you haven't taken out in the first place, nobody's got anything. So I mean, I've, I've taken, um, I always take out the maximum dividends and then tend to lend most of it back, which is handy right. this year, actually, because we made a loss because of COVID. So I won't be able to take dividends until you clear the loss. But I've got plenty of yeah. director's loan that I can draw out until that's the case. Yeah. So I'll still be able to take money out of the business. Without having to pay stupendous amount and does, of tax. Does the director's loan go, go on for years? I mean, can you can you roll it over from tax year to tax yes. year? Yes. Yeah. Um, the only yeah. time you have an okay. issue is if if you owe the company money. But a director's loan out is fine. You know where you've lent the company money. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. I, okay, I came across cool. someone at Wildbank um, who who lent his company a hundred thousand pounds and then charged it ten percent interest. And Fair actually, enough. do you know what? That's not a bad idea. <laughs> No, it isn't because if the company went anywhere else for money, they'd have to pay mm -hmm. interest, wouldn't they? Yeah. So, have you read Profit First by Michael M Michalski? No, but I have read uh, Black Swan by Nic Nicholas Nassim Taleb. <laughs> oh, yes, that's very good. I've, I've, I think I've read that one too. But Profit First is really interesting. It's all about how to turn your company from a gas guzzling monster into a profit making machine. And it literally swaps around the usual bookkeeping principles so it's in income less cost of sale less and then there's a profit a gross profit and and you pay yourself um as a director's salary provision and then there's also tax provision and there's you know vat and all that stuff but then out before you have any overheads at all you pay, you must pay yourself um the the, the owners of the business um, a profit so it's like paying your dividend first before overheads, because we all know that overheads will grow to swallow up any available. I'm always cash. guilty of that. I, 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 my worst thing is recruiting people too early. Yeah, as soon as you're yeah. too busy. But actually, you need to really push on and see what you can automate first. But that takes effort. It's much. Yes. I've always found it really easy to recruit people because partly because I teach, so I've always got yeah, fresh blood got a, available who are really interested students. in working for you. Yeah. <laughs> I can, I can yeah. literally like, just mention it in class and there'll be three people going, yeah, I'm interested. And like, They'll start next week. Jolly good. They've already been vetted because I've, you know, I've been marking their work. <laughs> yes. So you've got a tempting yeah. pool of talent. Just, and, and yeah, I'm guilty of it all the time. And, and of course, because of the university connection, you see other, other ways to tap in as well. There's often funded internship schemes. So you're like, oh, I, I can have uh, Sus University of Sussex does one every year, which is eight weeks completely paid for. You know, so you've got someone paid for. So you, and then what happens, well, what at, happens the at the end is you're like addicted to having someone working for you, so you keep them on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that must be very challenging, and also because you're working face to face with people, you get to know them better, don't you? It's very rare for me not I to definitely... keep one on. It does happen from time to time, but they're not always mm -hmm. a perfect fit for the business, and that's where it's good. You know, that's why they like it. It's eight weeks is enough time to find out if someone's a good fit. It just, it's the trouble is most people are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I just I I I've always been too independent to do that because I always feel I always feel right. Joseph Jaworski in Synchronicity, a path of leadership. He talks about the three entrepreneurs' traps, and one of them is the trap of responsibility. And this is the one I fall into. I think it's because I'm a big sister, the oldest 
in a set of four. And um, I always feel totally responsible for other people's happiness and welfare. And I cannot detach from that. So what I tend to do is go down the outsourcing route because I find it much easier to not get emotionally involved with the people I'm working with that way. That's a really good idea because, I mean, gosh, even in my first year of business, we got up to about nine members of staff. But I remember chatting to my dad, who I founded the business with one day and saying, why, why does it feel like we're running a care in the community service? Because <laughs> every, everyone has an issue. And a lot of your time is just spent managing people's issues, not their work, because of that caring yeah. nature. And I can see how ruthless people, you know, like um, psychopaths end up running big, successful companies because they don't have to focus on that or they don't care. Or <laughs> They have no empathy. Yeah. <laughs> so they just get on with the issues. business. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's um it's a really interesting one and, and one I've I've really fallen foul of many a times. I mean, I even we, you know, I even struggle having a cleaner because I get too emotionally involved with my cleaner, which is just ridiculous. I mean, I've become I mean, to be honest, my last cleaner was was fantastic and she she did become a really good friend and she bought a house in my favourite part of Greece. So I've been able to rent her house at rock bottom prices ever since. <laughs> that was a real uh, boon. But yeah. um, generally speaking, it's it's a challenge, I must well, say. I think you do get emotionally attached to cleaners because they know a lot about you. And sometimes they do funny stuff. I had a really short cleaner a few years back who, who accidentally locked herself in our understairs cupboard because she, she was able to walk into <laughs> it without ducking and then it just <laughs> shut behind her. <laughs> oh, my God, that's so funny. I had one once who locked himself in the vestibule so that, you know, you come in from the street. It was in Notting Hill. Come in from the street and there was a bit where you stand and then there was an oh, inner okay. lock and then there was the lock to the flat. And he managed to lock himself in the in the vestibule That's bit. Brilliant. I've not heard it the word hilarious. vestibule in far too long. Well, thank you. <laughs> yes. That's all right. I read a lot of costume dramas. Well, I used to anyway. <laughs> my my children take the mickey and say that I speak like a Victorian most of the time, or an, a, an Elizabethan Ooh. sometimes when I use really strange words. <laughs> cool. So have you brought anything for us to poke at today then? I, um so. In terms of what we were talking really about, poking things out, in, in my head, it was social media platforms, technology, certain businesses, anything we use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I'm quite interested in if I'm buying something regularly, you know, I mean, an easy example would be Amazon. Yeah, I'm constantly using Amazon Prime and yeah. buying stuff because it's convenient. Yeah. And then thinking, right, do the fundamentals work? Is that something worth investing in as well? Yeah. Well, that's how I made quite a bit of money in our SIPs. I'm, I'm up 149% because I swapped everything from the big Amazon, Facebook, McDonald's kind of companies to um, Zoom, Slack, Stripe, Square. The stuff Wix. we're using. Wix is doing really well this yeah. week. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't use Wix because I've moved on to uh, – obviously, you know, I'm a WordPress user, but that's um, – but all the other stuff that we use, I, you know, Stripe, Square, anything that makes it – Etsy. Yeah. Oh my God, Etsy's doing brilliantly. Anything that makes it easy for people to sell things or yeah. make things and sell them or um, yeah. automate their business for homework. Yeah. So, so big audiences and stuff we, we use or we even see people we know using and that they're happy with. <laughs> yes. Yes. If someone's whinging about something, I'll be like, well, maybe I won't invest in that one. <laughs> Yeah, well, eToro's not getting any of my investment because even though it's making it easier for me to invest in shares outside my SIP, that user interface is appalling. Can't get out of the screen where, you know, that you end up on after you put some more money in. Just I had to absolutely um, – what did I have to do? I have to uninstall the app, close my phone down, and then reinstall the app to be able to get back to the normal screen. Oh, well, I'm due to chat to them good, later today, so I'll have a word. Are you? What really? Yeah, I've got uh, oh. my my, mem oh, my yes, account so membership have. person is calling me up to tell me about all the benefits. Pete's such an important investor; he's got his own account membership person. <laughs> oh yeah, well have a go at the, about that for me because I'm it's driving me crazy. Okay. I would do that. But uh, th there's lots of other good ones that I just think, oh, this is so good. I'm, I really enjoy, enjoy using this. Tide's quite good. Revolut's very good. You know, some of the banking apps are really nice. I like nice. Tide. I, I mean, I'm particularly keen on them because their marketing was really up for it. So, for instance, in the early days, because we were quite a fast adopter of Tide, they 
they went and did blogs and interviews with some of their customers. We were one of those. So we've got oh, nice. blog posts oh, from our nice. bank. You know, they look after us. Yeah. And does it link back to yeah, your website? Absolutely. And they came and took they sent oh, a photographer awesome. along as well, took some nice pictures. It's me in a hammock looking quite relaxed. I haven't seen that one. You know, <laughs> I see, do you know what? I think I'm not standing there looking relaxed. One of my employees is in the hammock. It's a typical example. <laughs> yeah, a typical example of what we've just been talking about. <laughs> So they're, they're, they're lying back while you're taking all the responsibility. Yeah. So I like Tide for that. Um, I, I've always, I mean, my top tip has always been as well to have a different account for your business, a different bank for your business than your personal. Oh, definitely. Because even though yes. they're different, and especially how I run a limited company, it's a different legal entity. I used to have both banks in the beginning yeah. with Lloyd's. And one day they just randomly transferred money from a personal account to the business account to cover, a, to cover a bill. That's like, that's not how it works. <laughs> no, don't talk to me about Lloyd's because I had that terrible experience where they shut my business account down. It's a bit of a long story, but my accountant screwed up and they somebody they went to strike me off at company's house. And the first I knew of it was my Lloyd's business account being shut down. And so I got onto them straight away and they I said, this is a total mistake. We'll be fixing it today. And my accountant got to be, yeah. to give him his credit, got it, got me reinstated immediately. Although it sits on your record. I didn't realize that. And, um, and, but I went back to Lloyd's and they said, well, we've got six weeks till, till it closes finally. So come back to us as soon as it's reinstated and we can see it on com the company's yeah. list. And of course, it, when I went back to tell them that it had been reinstated about three weeks later, they'd already closed the account down. So that wasn't good. I wasn't okay, happy man. about that. That was when I went to Tide. <laughs> I, I mean, poking at that it's, sort of thing. The other reason I really thought Tide would take off, and I would love to be able to invest in things like that, is just how easy it was to open an account. You know, it shows you what we should all be doing in business. I think I was sitting there on a yeah. Sunday at home. So, all right, I'll have a look at her banking apps because I knew I needed to move from Lloyd's or something like that. I can't remember. Yes, I think it was Lloyd's mm -hmm. I was closing down. And uh, five minutes later, I'd scanned a picture of my passport, filled in a few fields on the app, done a picture or a video, I can't remember, for identity purposes. Yeah. And it was open. And the card arrived in the post like two days later. Trading. I know. Well, I, I literally, between calls this morning, I opened a new Tide there account. I mean, now I've got a and currency it's, account it's, it's, in there as well because, you know, as they add features, yeah. you can try stuff out. But. Yeah. And um, it, it is it is brilliant. I mean, I think I've got five accounts now and they all work off the, sa the same app. I can just choose which account I want to do at the top, which is a little bit dangerous because one can always make a mistake. But yeah. hopefully that won't happen. Well, it's bad enough with like, <laughs> four different cards in your wallet, you know, because <laughs> my, my other yeah. tip is always have at yeah. least two bank accounts particularly when I was traveling a lot last year and before for some reason, I mean, I've got like a MasterCard with HSBC and also another one with Tide and randomly in a different country, one will work and one won't. And I know I've, I've what's that about? checked into hotels, not <laughs> yeah. been able to check into hotels. And then you walk over to the cash point machine, which charges an exorbitant and fee and you're able, you're able to get cash out, but they won't accept it at the hotel desk. It's bizarre. That's why I opened Tide. <laughs> Um, in particular, was because of how they treat foreign currency. So they they don't take um, they don't charge a fee for your foreign currency transactions. So when you're spending abroad, and I was traveling every other week, you just get the basic Mastercard rate. So it costs you so oh, okay. much less. That's pretty good. Oh my yeah. God, that's and what brilliant. the thing I have to remember whenever I'm buying a service online, you know, a new bit of software you pay for monthly, is to use the right card if it's in dollars. Because like if I use my HSBC oh, okay. card, I'll get like a I don't know, big chunky fee every time there's a transaction of currency conversion. Yeah. Whereas if I do it on Tide, it's just yeah. no cost. I I I can't even begin to ask you how you keep track of your finances with all different currency accounts and things like that. It must be very. Do you use, um, use zero, zero or something? Um, and does that keep track of everything? Yeah, really so often well? I use the multi-currency version of it, and and to a certain extent, yeah. I collect currencies in it. So I always try and spend at least one thing on the business when I'm abroad so I can put another currency in. Okay. <laughs> You're very funny. Gamifying your own finances here. <laughs> the company finances. You know, I'm yeah. all, I'm like, so what, the country. Um, I haven't spent anything yet. I'll have a coffee. 
<laughs> Funny. So what uh, what's your week looking like? What's what's what have you been up to in the last week and what are you looking forward well, to? You're, this you're week? interviewing again. I know, but someone's got to do it, otherwise we'll never move this conversation okay. on. <laughs> okay. So my I mean, under COVID weeks are really odd, but generally speaking, I've got half of Monday, all of Wednesday looking after my daughter, which mm. She's an only child, so it's quite difficult to get any work done during those moments. Occasionally, occasionally she get into a book, and then I'll get a couple of hours work done, but it's quite rare. Um, yeah. On the plus side, we play a lot of games together, which is useful for my job of being gamification expert. Yeah, mm. so I'm. She's. I've got her hooked on Dungeons and Dragons. So yesterday was three hours of Dungeons and Dragons adventuring. Um. One of my team was eaten by a shark. This is very sad. <laughs> what? Because okay. I'm clueless about Dungeons and Dragons, so I have no idea what you're okay. talking about. <laughs> Good. That's fine. I'll, I'll get. We'll get Lana on as a guest in that case. Tell us all about it at some point. Well, it'll need to be Lana explaining it before I understand it. To be honest, <laughs> it's, it's, it's simple enough. It's like um, you, someone runs a story, an adventure for you, and you take part in the adventure. Yeah. So. And and is the outcome a foregone conclusion, or does it change as the, the adventure goes along? It changes as the adventure goes along, and um, it's dice based to make sure you don't know what will happen. That's why one of the characters died yesterday. The uh, wow the shark didn't miss and did lots of damage, and my spellcaster friend he died. So did does Lana when she's a dungeon master does she have to think up six outcomes on each possible turning point of the story Um you you have to think on your feet it's good for, it's really good for you to be the dungeon master So for her birthday the other day I got her a starter kit as a dungeon master She's been playing the other way around so mm. I'd had to do the hard work of dungeon mastering but I figured she would like cuz she likes making up the rules and bossing people around so it's a good right. fit Right sounds good brilliant fit. a future yeah, leader Definitely and and she is hooked on making me take part in these adventures, and she's getting to grips with it. Is good. That's very cool. Uh, but I I mean I like taking part because it reminds me of some of the stuff that is why I got into gamification. I, I used to do Dungeons and Dragons twenty five thirty years ago. <laughs> yeah, um, and I still had the stuff. That's how much I enjoyed it. Why not? I used it for twenty years, but I still had a pile of all the. Just in case you wanted to set a game yeah. up, <laughs> or to go and take part in one, yeah. Brilliant. Because um, yeah. I mean, I I really love big epic uh, fantasy adventure sagas. You know, space yeah. operas are my favourite reading. So it's a similar kind of thing, isn't it? It is. I yeah, it's just the setting. I, there are space. I'm pretty sure there are space opera type se settings. So you could take part. In. You could be taking part in your own sci-fi adventure. Yeah. yeah. Well, I feel I feel like we are sometimes right now, to yeah, be honest. True. Dystopian. <laughs> I like the fact early on in quarantine and COVID, the Black Mirror creator said, we're not going to do any this year. The world is dark enough. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And um, just coming back to the Fed thing today, I was watching someone's video, um, a lady called Lynette Zhang, who is incredibly, she looks like a, like a very well-groomed granny, and she's from the Bronx, so she's got quite a, a twangy, a twangy accent, granny. But she's very, very a twangy, twangy granny. That's right. And she was saying, because we all know digital currency is coming, and that that'll be the way the governments get the money out to the people and bypass the banks. Um, but there will be costs associated with that. And one of the things that the um, document that Lynette was reading out today says that banks would be able to limit access to the digital platforms according to how the, the knowledge they have on their customers. So in other words, creditworthiness. It's is that what it is? Is that what they're yeah. talking about? But but what they're saying is if say for example you're getting universal basic basic income if they bring Which that would be in, cool. We should definitely then, poke at that at some point. Yes, yes. There's lots of different thoughts about that um, around swirling around me at the moment. And um, but what they're saying is that they can limit people's access to their own money based on customer behavior. So if, for example, you don't do things that the government want you to do, let's just throw vaccine, have a vaccine out there. Um, they can limit your access to your cash. 
which is not your cash, really. It's the government's, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's interesting. Well, I mean, they've, they've done this historically, haven't they? You know, pay rent payments direct to the landlord instead of to you. Stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. Control. It's all about oh, control, It's also it? about understanding the weaknesses of someone who's getting that money. I, I feel like it depends how it's implemented. I, I'm, thinking about, Ooh, look I think, at that. I'm thinking about my Monzo account, okay, which you can opt in to tell it not to allow any payments to gambling sites. Right. Yeah, so if it sees those, it'll just say, no, blocked, blocked. So you're basically self-selecting to block certain types of payment to protect yourself. That's an interesting one. So no no online wine yeah, subscriptions. Yeah, that sort of thing, if you're an alcoholic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. But then you just get another card, wouldn't you, if you want. That's, 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 I suppose that's gamifying your own good behaviour, isn't it? Well, it's, um, it's giving you a crutch for your willpower, isn't it, I think, more than anything. It's not really yeah. gamifying it. Um, it's more it's putting a process, a, like a rule in place. I remember years ago when one of my friends was quitting smoking and uh, – he got this timed box. So every two hours, it would release one cigarette. So he couldn't smoke more. Okay. Yeah. So it was like self I've never heard of that. Yeah. It, it didn't work for him in the end. So, <laughs> well, I think people, people, people hack, don't we? We all know ways to hack, even systems that we've set up ourselves. We all, we're constantly trying to hack, game the system, yeah, aren't be, we? That's, that's where the expression well, came from. Well, he'd be from. in the pub and then the person next to him would be saying, well, would you like one then? He'd be like, oh, yes, thanks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can pay you back in 15 exactly. minutes <laughs> when, my, when my box opens. <laughs> Hilarious. So apart from doing Dungeons Dra and Dragons this week, what were you oh, doing? Was that, that's not my whole week. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so <laughs> I'm doing quite a lot at the moment. So on the on the sort of the stuff that happens uh, this afternoon, I'm presenting to the Public Speakers Association of India um, on about being pub public speaker. Okay, so that's um, I mean it's this afternoon for me, but it'll be like seven p.m. for them. So that'll be live. Wow, how many people? How many people? I don't on that? know, but it's like um, it's probably oh, quite a few. Thousands. I don't know. I actually have no idea. I should have asked. <laughs> Doesn't matter anyway, does it? You'll just be yourself, and you'll that's be fine. That's my plan. Yeah. Um, so that's like a bit of a one-off. Um, but that's. I mean, there's the inv invitation is from someone who attended one of my training courses in India two years ago. You know, so these things nice. come around. Yeah. Um, I've got too much on my plate at the moment. So a couple of weeks ago, I put up a post on LinkedIn about looking for help with one aspect of my business, the Gamification Awards. So I have have been having loads of chats with the various different people who are interested, which is quite a lot. And now I've got... Oh, that's great. There are lots of people who are interested. But now I've got to decide on who and which approach to take. So one company came to me and said, well, we'd just like to buy it, stick it on our balance sheet and run with it and make loads of money. And then I've had a bunch of people who want to volunteer and just do aspects of it. And they've all got different strengths. So um, I've got to decide. Or I've got to, and, and the one put the company that came to buy it, want to buy it, my only issue with them is they historically they are a customer of mine and they've always been one of the worst payers. <laughs> right. So you've got some sort of payment payment um, arrangement to make there. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to put more thought into that part of it than, than potentially with anyone else. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think if you're getting rid of something because it's taking up a lot of your time and energy, then an outright sale would be a good way to go. But yeah, you need to make sure that you get your money. And and are you wedded to the idea of um, having ongoing royalties to compensate you for the time that you've put in and building it up in the first place, or wedded not necessarily? To, no, I mean I, I would. I know they haven't got a lump sum. Okay, so so it would right. be ongoing in oh. that case. Um, okay, well, then you do have an issue, the fact that they're not great players. <laughs> correct. Uh, but, I mean, I've done uh, it before. This would be the third part of the business I'd have sold. So yeah, um, the last one being a telecoms business eight years ago, which is still paying a monthly earnout. So these yeah. things do happen. Well, that's nice. It did get paused for a yeah. few months during COVID, but they still, yeah. you know, encouraged invoicing, and then they started payments again. And they paid paid, oh, nice. paid actual bills but there was a an extra bonus bit, so they had to. So. Perhaps that's something we could talk about as well in the future: is how to get a business. You know what what to think about when you're you're getting a business ready for sale. Because I've never done that, 
but I know my my previous pod, podcast partner had sold several businesses. Yeah. So so my business is split in three. So there's there's me in consulting and doing stuff around that. There's a conference and there's an awards business. Okay, and they all support each other. But the awards and the conference mm. are particularly set up with the aim of probably selling them at some point because they both they just need track record and companies in those arenas conferences and awards businesses tend to grow by buying other awards and conferences mm. yeah so there's a ready mm. market there's a known process and there's probably um although i haven't looked it up yet a valuation type so when i sold the telecoms company eight years ago telecoms companies grow by taking more lines more connections which gives them bulk discounts with their suppliers Okay, so they mm. have to do that, and so there are valuations out there. A couple of different approaches: ones around turnover, ones around profit, runs around uh, how long you keep your clients for. So a bit of checking on customer service. Churn, yeah. Um, it was quite easy to come up with some figures, and actually sold it within a month. Um, and I only approached my existing suppliers, four of them, I think. All but one put an offer in, and the one the one that didn't put an offer in. <laughs> just made me laugh because he just felt personally broke because he just spent like 20 grand on dentistry. <laughs> <laughs> so he was like, I'm not just, I'm not in, in an investment mode. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, again, this is something we should talk about perhaps, but, but you know, I, I, the whole thing, the psychology of approaching your suppliers, letting them know that you're open to a sale, yeah. you know, you think would make them nervous in some way, but I suppose giving them first option to buy is a good idea, isn't it? It is. And uh, they were all aware that there were multiple suppliers because you have different aspects coming in. So there's an mm. element where they want to take, make sure their competitor doesn't get it, which is good. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of them I'd approached, in fact, actually one wasn't a supplier, but I knew they, they were aggressively buying up companies and I'd met them locally. Yeah. Uh, so they, they put in a low ball offer because they didn't really know the business because they weren't a, a current supplier. But they then went to all the others with like, well, I've already had one offer, <laughs> which made it much yeah, easier. That's right. Psychological game. <laughs> yeah, it just gives you confidence. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. So they're a speaking gig virtually and um, making a decision about else? that. I also need to launch yep. uh, my conference. But the key thing I need to do is just announce the dates so people save the dates. I know what they are, but I haven't right. updated anything on the yeah. web yet and start right. sending. Um, request to my previous sponsors about how, what level of involvement they want this year because you want a few sponsors on board before you do announce to the wider public yes um yes of course. and that, that's always something i do at this time of year and i've got a because i teach part-time i've got a convert all my in-person content to online content by the beginning of october and i really need to start doing that faster than i've been doing it <laughs> 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 making videos oh my god that is hard work <laughs> uh, what else um in seven minutes time i've got a video premiering premiering on youtube for one of our speakers from last year's conference so we, we are uploading one of those nice. every week roughly um and doing social media around that getting an audience for it i'm having and premiering means that you you're there to answer to, to in the it chat means there's a live chat ability well. yeah so yeah um and then also, I, I think, and I don't know this for sure, I was going to ask you about this, but I think when you're premiering, if you get enough people doing it, you can boost the numbers at the beginning, and that helps with the algorithm with YouTube for spreading the word as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I think there's a small amount you can pay to get it out to more well, people. Not even that. What I was saying is because you've got viewers, more than one at the same time, it appears in searches better because there's live viewers of something. Yes. And if you get enough of them, you appear on the front page of YouTube. Yeah, I'm not sure we're going to hit that. but <laughs> You might hit the you know front page of your classification, whatever yeah. it is, your gamification. That sort of thing. So, I, so we've, I mean, I'm, this is only the third or fourth one we've premiered because I've been testing it recently. But I have noticed we've had more viewers faster than previously yeah. just uploading yeah. it. Yeah, so this is part yeah, of the I need, I need to do that with my Vs. I need to do that with my Vzine that goes out weekly. and. Yeah. Um, I've just got to get my VA to put it on to premiere at a certain time. So rather than actually just release publish at a certain time, there are so I can be there, to it, uh, which is like, which are <laughs> so more to do with people's incompetence. Okay. But basically 
when you share the the fact that you're premiering a video, people can sign up for a reminder. But so, for instance, yes, here regularly. here is this. I, I will notify the speaker, give them like two or three weeks warning, so that they can be there, they can share it, and do things like that. But most of my speakers are a bit disorganised. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's great. And then they do nothing with it. Whereas if I just put it straight up there, they'd immediately be sharing the video and doing more activity online around. Yes, yeah? yes. So you, you kind of also need to then tell them how to approach it to make sure they're there, that they've got friends and family watching it at the same time. You know, telling them how to do their marketing for them. Yeah, yeah. Infuriating. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, this is, this is one of the things I'm enjoying learning at the moment. Yeah, premiering on YouTube. <laughs> yes, it was. It sounds fancier. Does it sounds fancier than it possibly is? But I definitely think it. Well, I know from several of my clients that who do it that it does increase viewership. Definitely. What else? I've got one other thing I've so got to do. I've got through. two things to do tomorrow that I have to do. One is do my pay run, which is actually the last month I'm going to have staff of my own. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sort of like, oh, this would be interesting doing the pay run payroll for the last month. Um. And I've also got to prep some questions because I've got to write an article for a journal on organizational leadership and how people create a, a culture of play or gamified culture within an organization so that there's acceptance of it. And to push myself to actually do this article, I have arranged an interview with a CEO and that's next Tuesday. So I need to write the questions. <laughs> <laughs> enough for you but you've got plenty to be getting on with it yeah. haven't you? what about you what is the rest yeah. of your week well i'm <laughs> well i'm doing a uh i'm doing a, a five-day challenge starting on monday the 7th of september which is all around bit how to be everywhere online but how to automate and outsource it so that you just create your content ideally once a quarter for the next quarter but sometimes some people do it once a month some people do it once a week um but then I've got to promote promote that five day challenge. So uh, I've got to release content on every social media platform. And um, the more I do, the more people I'll get signing up to the challenge. But uh, it's it's a it's a challenge doing that because a lot of most of my day to day marketing is outsourced, as you know. So I just create the content. I, I follow my own system, essentially. Yeah. So this this challenge is a lot more hands on. For is it because it, so it to falls do... outside of your normal system and how it works? Yes, yes, exactly. And I haven't yet created a system for the five day challenge. I wanted to do a few to ah. find out if they were wor worth doing. And the last one very much was um, it, it had a very high conversion rate from uh, registrants to participants to active participants in the challenge and then um, sales at the end of my one year mentoring program and it worked very well so I'm well, that, committed that to doing like it them needs regularly. a system then if that's what it needs to well it does you. yes it does yes but uh, it's about creating content that's specific to the challenge so I'm doing that as I go along and then I'm storing it in a, a folder for next time. So next time there'll be more content, promotional content that can be reused. So next time, you and, know, it'll um, be easier, but this time it's like, oh, it's hard. Yes, yes, yes. I'm supposed to be doing six pieces of content on every platform every day. Oh, it sounds to so, me like you, you're following a process from someone else's five day challenge. Is this? Yes, I am indeed. <laughs> yes, I am. And best practices say that, you know, not everyone's watching all the time on every platform. Yeah. So you need to be there all the time. Um, but I'm I'm gearing up to it slowly. So that's my main focus at the moment. But uh, I'll be a week nearer than when we talk next week. So I'll let you know how it, how it's going. Yeah. So it's almost your five working day challenge until it launches. Yeah. Yes. A it's a, well, it was supposed to be a three three week promotional period and i slacked horribly the first week because things were really getting interesting with the investing space and so i was following a lot more of that now i've really got to knuckle down and do it starting in one minute's time okay <laughs> let's do that <laughs> yeah, let's do that and i'll uh, we'll talk again next All week right. well it's been a pleasure as always nicola it has been a pleasure as always see you next week speak to you soon bye You're listening to the Poke It Podcast with Pete Jenkins and Nicola Cancross. You can find me at gamificationplus.uk and Nicola at clicksandleads.com.